this game is beautiful. I would have never expected to say that about something as fleshy and gross as corn, but it's an absolutely masterfully crafted experience. As I got used to jankier and visually dated games, I started discovering a whole world of untalked about games that fascinate me. Not always in intentional ways, but it's a real neat feeling not knowing what to expect, seeing the games at least attempt some experimentation. That made me completely uninterested in big new releases these days because the big budget titles need to ensure monetary success and avoid pretty much anything uncommon, anything risky. The AAA games seemed painfully predictable, yet Scorn had me extremely excited. Sure, it's not quite a AAA game, but it made a lot of ripples ever since the first announcement. I believe I haven't been as hyped for a game for such a long amount of time since Diablo 3, and that um, didn't turn out all that great. Nevertheless, I had backed Scorn on Kickstarter all those years ago because it seemed like exactly my kind of horror game. It does not contain cheap, scripted jump scares, it does not rely on frustrating stealth mechanics or some boogeyman constantly chasing the player. Instead, it's more of a slow burner, an atmospheric adventure game with a horror coat of paint. And not just any coat of paint, but one heavily inspired by Hans Rudi Giga and Zislav Bekshinsky, absolute masters of apocalyptic visions and body horror. Despite being shaped for the video game medium, Scorn primarily is an art piece. I won't get into the whole our video games art discussion right now. Let's simply talk presentation. Ever since the initial trailers and the alpha demo available to Kickstarter backers, Scorn showcased an incredibly strong artistic vision. I was still taken aback by the wonderful presentation of the game from start to finish when the finished version came out. It had my mouth agape in both wonder and terror the whole time. Just like that episode with a bear and a lion from the Teletubbies when I was a baby, that stuff was traumatizing with the lion being hyped up to be scary for several minutes straight. I am the scary lion with big scary teeth. To then chase the silly bear with the intent to kill. Uh, back to Scorn. The environment itself is one of the main characters of the game, being made out of flesh and bones, weird organs of unknown purpose and otherworldly biomechanical contraptions. It's like a single living and breathing uniform organism that's graphically executed in a brilliant fashion. At this point I think it's useless telling that the game looks stunning. There aren't any straight lines making everything look both unusual and very natural, just like the shapes of nature. It's impossible to tell where living tissue ends and where machinery starts, it becomes nearly one the same. There's barely any UI too, making all the visuals even more immersive. I'd like to praise the slightly overshadowed marvel of sound design and score too. Because it is some of the best I had ever heard. The soundscapes feel like they actually make me hear the environment. The space itself. The open areas sound absolutely massive. While smaller corridors are made to sound claustrophobic. The sound of scorn feels desolate, yet also always tense, as if something is always crawling nearby. There are very few moments that sound like music, but when they appear, they feel glorious.
The sound effects are visceral too. Everything has this meaty feel, as it's supposed to, but at the same time, the machines have this sensation of metal and bones grinding against each other. Everything sounds stunningly organic and physical. And when it comes to gameplay, well, I'm just starting and I'm already dangerously close to spoiler territory. Scorn is a game mainly focused around exploration. There aren't any dialogues or text logs scattered around the levels. It's about piecing the story from the details in the environment. I've been waiting for this game to come out for years upon years, so doing a shallow spoiler-free review wouldn't be satisfying for myself, especially when Scorn, to me, feels brilliant. And I'm just itching to talk about it. So, I'll perform a deep dive into the guts of the game, and dissect my own thoughts about the game and interpretations of the plot chapter by chapter, all while occasionally referring to some outside material from the official artbook and even fan theories. The whole point of the video would be lost if I added a spoiler skipping timestamp, so if you're curious about the game, but are avoiding the big S's, I wholeheartedly recommend experiencing Scorn without any prior knowledge, alone, in a dim room, and with some nice headphones on. As for the rest of you, we're going to be talking about the penis! We're going to be talking about the vagina! And if you find that amusing, you're in the right place, brother. Jokes aside, go grab some nice snacks, get comfortable, because we are sitting out on quite a trip. The very first shots of the game depict a person waking up from a seemingly uncomfortable slumber and crawling towards mysterious structures within the quickly switching shots, which I can only assume are flashbacks of sorts. It's pretty tricky to piece their chronology together, It'll come important. These flashing shots are there for a reason, but for now, the main character essentially remembers being above the surface of a desolate world and falling down an abyss into a factory-like place in which the game begins. Immediately, the environment feels breathtaking, and I'm invested into simply exploring the place. There is a sprint button, but I barely ever feel like using it, because I just want to take in the sights. The one thing that's quickly apparent is that the place is deserted. There's not a living soul. It looks poorly maintained. Some of the objects are straight up broken. There's no telling what happened to this place, but nothing good for sure. The player quickly approaches a closed gate and two operational machines. One provides the key to operate the other, which opens the gate. Getting the key is... nasty. The player has to stick their arm into a weird pipe-like contraption, body horror style, in order to get it penetrated by some machinery. The hand is left hurting and bleeding, but a spike-like key implant is now attached to it, which enables the connection with some other interfaces. And those interfaces… they look as if they're alive themselves, with their veins holding the pieces together and the muscles pulsating. It's completely alien technology which the player has to figure out how to use themselves. It's pretty neat. The first puzzle is seemingly one of the more elaborate ones in the game, expanding across multiple rooms across multiple floors. There are cards, cranes, some weird torture devices and some funky out-of-body vision rails control panel. At first everything feels odd, it's difficult to figure out the purpose of anything. The game evokes a sense of being lost. I can only deduct that most of the machines are designed for a humanoid creature such as myself, something that I don't see any of around. Eventually, after checking all the accessible rooms, I get the bright idea of following the rails and seeing where they start. They lead me to the crane thing that picks up large objects from above. Second floor it is. And man, the second floor with its more open space looks great. It seems to have a wall full of some sort of giant eggs. Some have glowy dots, and there's actually a sliding puzzle, so I assume I had to get those glowy eggs. It was fairly tricky, but satisfying I must say. 
just the right amount of difficulty for a puzzle. When I eventually get the egg, it turns out there's someone resembling a contorted person inside. I get it in a card, stamp it, and then I have to choose between the two torture chambers. One has a scoop and a bunch of empty eggshells on the ground, the other, a brutal circular saw and a lot of discarded limbs, and even a shriveled up figure in an embryo pose. You can make up your mind from these details which room is less cruel, yet I, partially by accident, partially because I thought both rooms would be steps of the same process, got the egg to the saw room. It was an ugly sight, but hey, I got the little dude out of the egg. Alive! It barely knows how to use its atrophied legs, but I'm its mama now. I needed this fellow because the gate to the next area requires two people to open, sort of like the nuclear missile launch thing. I get to do the arm implant, get it to help me open the door, slightly forcefully mayhaps, and unfortunately am forced to leave it behind. The other option had me trying to scoop out the dude out of the egg, but it just brutally kills it and discards it into a body hole, leaving only a torn off arm behind, which I use as a tool. It seems a lot more cruel at first, but thinking back of leaving the dude behind, being too brain dead to pull his hand out of the machine, it might be the worst fate. While I have mixed feelings of the torture rooms, and environments being actively deceiving, I like how neither choice is really the good one. It's all good old morally grey area. Strangely enough, it's the only choice there is to make in the whole game. The only slightly branching path. Everything else is very linear. I'm slightly disappointed that that's the case, but this first segment of the game did showcase several things. The world of scorn is a world of pain. Whoever engineered this place had no regard for ethics or even bodily harm. Implanting devices required to operate the machinery causes physical harm. Living creatures, seemingly sentient humanoids, are harvested and butchered like cattle. Body and flesh aren't something highly regarded. It's pretty much just a building material, since everything seems to be made out of the same guts, muscles and shells. Even if we manage to feel some empathy for the poor fellow there, I'm clearly forced to make it suffer for the sake of progress, simply because this place is designed this way. Next up comes some even more fleshy chambers, full of corpses and some slimy cocoons. Here I get the first weapon in the game, which is more of a tool made to operate some heavy machinery, but also doubles as a close range weapon that can punish things with a tiny xenomorph mouse like thing at the dangerous end of it. By no coincidence, I also run into the first living creatures, some flying drones tending to the cocoons. I have to force my way past them in order to do something with the big pillar structure at the center of the room. It seems to be pumping nutrients to the surrounding cocoons, and I'm reactivating it, but this flesh machinery has been long abandoned and in poor condition. A malfunction occurs, and I'm drowned in sticky meat goo. After seemingly dying, the player wakes up covered in a gross, fleshy and surprisingly hard shell with what looks like an umbilical cord attached to their torso. They break out of the pod to find themselves in a completely different area, the place from the flashback in the very beginning, the pink Mars sunset looking desert. The player has just emerged from one of the eggs to see nothing but dust and dead bodies around. Also there is no more implant left in the arm. So, does this take place earlier than the previous sequence? That has yet to be answered. This area is one of my favorites in the game simply because of how beautiful it is. Wandering the desert feels like being a newborn with a veil over their eyes, both figuratively and literally. Everything is still very confusing, and the heavy winds in the desert make the view distance quite short. Only just about making out silhouettes of structures when they're already close by. Out of the mist, a giant structure emerges, as if a corpse of a behemoth who died of thirst. The empty pod-like structures around resemble a graveyard, and everything is surrounded by an enormous wall to keep whatever is inside, inside. After the dark claustrophobic tunnels, this area feels soul-crushingly enormous. 
I make my way into the building to find myself back in the assembly, and I'm greeted by a creepy crawly creature. Uh oh. That's going to catch me eventually, isn't it? I end up needing to collect 4 glitterous meat bagels on my key thing through performing lockpicking like minigames of increasing difficulty in different rooms. It's surprisingly tactile and satisfying. I traverse the convoluted tunnels looking for these key pieces and yep, I'm ambushed by the crawler and the thing's absolutely disgusting, having its inner organs exposed. It latches onto my back and hugs me to dig its arms into my belly. It does not kill me though, it simply attaches to me like a parasite and oh, its tail has the tool gun attached to it. That's convenient. Eventually I get all four pieces and use them to solve one more puzzle here, which must be my favorite in the game. It isn't really difficult, but it takes a bit of figuring out how it works, making for this aha moment when it clicks. It's a good representation of the puzzles in Scorn overall, whether environmental or minigames. They take some exploration and experimentation to figure out what does what, and when it starts making sense, it's very satisfying to finally solve them. I say they're as intuitive as they get without there being any text in the game too. I never felt like I needed to look things up outside the game. If I got stuck, I simply needed to look around more because there are only so many things to do. The puzzles are not hard enough to become bothersome, but not too easy making them trivial either. And since the final click figuring things out is the most important part of the puzzles, the minigames don't really repeat because already knowing how they work would make them a chore, not a challenge. Say what you will, but I'm a big fan of how the puzzles are designed in Scorn. Anyway, with the 4 key pieces I open 4 flower like meat pods, receive a new device for opening locked doors and a deep sea creature looking thing. Out of one of the pods a man crawls out, this time a much prettier looking one but seemingly not developed enough to live. At this point, this is the third time we've witnessed someone hatch, every time slightly differently, but there are some patterns. It's always humanoid creatures, which are mammals by nature, yet they're born from some plant-like eggs. Despite that, the birth still seems gynecological due to the umbilical cord the player was attached to. All the creatures are already born in adult bodies, implying that there's likely some experiments going on with farming people, making them in the most efficient way possible. No more pregnant bellies weighing down women, no more infancy and childhood, just growth with minimal care and instant deployment to whatever purpose, whether it's work or being recycled for materials. I move further and the parasite is not happy. We make our way to the first location in the game, and it's quite different, looking even more rundown than before. This is taking place after the accident then, and there's no telling how much time had passed since then, but one thing can be deduced. I'm no longer playing as the guy from the beginning of the game. I'm a freshly hatched man. The further location I delve into, titled The Crater, is looking even more messy now overgrown with bloody flesh tumors. Whatever the previous guy spilled seems to have evoked new meaty organisms to grow everywhere, infecting the place like a virus. I guess the nutrients that were used to grow people went where they were not supposed to and made the meat farm go haywire. Even worse, there are living creatures within the flesh growth, living completely cramped among one another like ants forming body bridges for more flesh to grow. They may not be capable of reasoning, but they're capable of moving and fighting. All those noises from around the place finally pose danger to the player. These creatures are weird though. They seem like animals, but they also have human-like pale skin. Very few animals in nature possess that, so I like to think that it's the farm people gone wrong, not as developed. These animals look and move a bit like babies if you squint your eyes. This area is also where the game expands upon the combat system. You can find the first actual gun that resembles a pistol. The gun itself is like a living creature, or rather it's an attachment to a creature. 
To make it alive and functional, I attach it to the tail of the parasite, which is like a handle. The weird sea creature looking thing I picked up earlier is also held by one of the parasite's arms, and turns out it's meant as a pincushion for tooth-like bullets and healing juice. Looks like the player's character and the parasite have a symbiotic relationship. The parasite feeds on the player, gets some protection and in return allows carrying more things, more means of defending oneself. It still digs deeper into the belly, taking away health. But hey, not much I can do about that living backpack. Fighting is not the easiest, or the most satisfying in this game, but it's so by design. Way back from the alpha demo, it was clear to me that the main character of the game is not a fighter. He cannot dodge quickly, he's slow at aiming, he's clearly out of his comfort zone, and the great majority of the creatures to fight look fragile, pathetic even. They're innocent animals, incapable of reason, so there's not much meaning in killing them either, aside from self-defense. They're probably instinctively defending themselves too, simply protecting their territory. Switching the weapon types is slow. I kind of miss the feature of having to manually open up the gun to count the bullets from the alpha, but I guess that was cut because it would bog down the already slow process even more. In a way I get it, but I also miss it. It makes sense that combat is unwieldy. It's hard to avoid taking damage. The best fight is the one that didn't happen. In a great majority of the cases, it is possible to avoid fighting. I certainly did, because ammo is also very limited. Sometimes if you run away, the creatures also wander off somewhere, allowing you to pass, but also increasing the anxiety of not knowing where they went and where they could re-emerge. Also, how the heck do I heal? Welp, at least all the controls are probably on display instantly in the pause menu. It's... <sighs> I can store some healing juice which the parasite helps me inject directly in my bloodstream. Aside from the enemies, there's not too much new in this zone. The environment is a bit more expansive and makes the player be mindful of the three-dimensional layout of the zone in order to solve the puzzles. It also has the one minigame that I genuinely hated. There are also some of these dangling things which have been nerfed a lot since the alpha. Originally they forced the player to break line of sight immediately or die, and now they just spit stuff like everyone else. That's sad. Things get different when I encounter a new type of creature. It's big, it's mean, and it always seems to inhabit pretty tight places. It looks like something I don't want to fight at all because it would most likely take a lot of beating while being able to squash me easily. I mean, even more easily. The weakest creatures are plenty dangerous already. This was actually terrifying though. A more classic horror game feel kicks in where I have to run on a hide, but it's actually surprisingly enjoyable. I guess because this sort of stuff is used sparingly in Scorn, and it's still possible to defeat these monsters. Still, encountering them is unpleasant. In a fun way. The game makes me think fast to avoid getting trampled. The first time one of these is encountered, the game makes the player use the close range weapon to open a gate. Switching to the pistol would take time, so the player is left extra vulnerable in front of the biggest threat so far. That's sneaky, but clever. Eventually, I can find a shotgun which makes defeating these creatures more manageable, but it's still pretty intense. And what shotgun it is? In gaming, shotguns are likely the guns that have the most style points. They look cool, and they're impactful. The one scorn has three revolving meat barrels, guarded by a bone shell. It's awesome. Anyway, that sort of perfect placement and timing of Every element is a sort of thing that continues throughout the whole game, and it's a feeling of everything being very deliberately crafted to the smallest details. Everything looks and sounds just right, evoking just the right sensations. Everything in the environment is placed thoughtfully to make for the best pacing. Everything just feels connected. All parts of a huge wall. The entire game I was tense. I was amazed, I was constantly theorizing about what's going on. Scorn really made me feel. 
Things rarely get me emotional, but Scorn did deeply. I'm still amazed at the grotesque beauty of it and how carefully it's thought out, but I'm getting a little sidetracked. I run from the monsters, finger more levers, my parasite roots deeper inside and outside me, and holy fuck what is that? This creature is enormous, growing its gargantuan body on top of whatever facilities. These artificial people growing experiments have gone very wrong. This creature is probably the mother queen of all the other weird creatures, and it has nearly human features when it comes to the body, the arms and breasts and whatnot. The face especially is the most human-like thing in the game so far, further solidifying my idea that these monsters are people gone wrong. This creature is so huge it's incapacitated, it can only move its head to look around, yet I'm forced to tear her some new ones to get to where I need. Every time she screams in pain and keeps looking at me. I can only wonder if she's looking at what this threat is supposed to be, or do these sad eyes understand that I have no other choice? Perhaps it might even want to be put out of its terrifying and miserable existence. The room below her turns out to be a massive elevator to the last major zone. I ascend out of the overgrown tunnels, unfortunately uprooting and likely killing the big mama. I'm really unsure if it's a bad or a good thing and whether my means justify my ends, but I only have one way to move. I get onto a rail car and travel even further to find myself in some sort of a sacral palace. It's no less abandoned than all the other locations, but the scenery is quite different. The dark, meaty surfaces are replaced by nearly bone-white structures, decorated with the humanoid sculptures depicting, let's say, the miracle of birth. These are giant statues of pregnant mothers, women with their legs spread wide apart, men with these as big as cannons, <laughs> as well as depictions of various sexual acts. There are statues that look like large phallic objects containing people inside, entering the women sitting on top of them. It could hardly be more blatant than whatever society lived there was worshipping fertility through natural means, through intercourse between a male and a female, as opposed to people being grown in pods we've been seeing all along. I can only speculate but such obsession to the point of worship usually focuses on unobtainable things, such as heaven or eternal life. It makes me think that the civilization that built all this had possibly lost the means to reproduce naturally, hence all the cloning facilities. Or maybe it's the opposite. The cloning facilities were so efficient, natural reproduction became completely obsolete, ruling out intimacy and maternity out of people's lives. Either way, this place is quite the sight to behold. It alone is like an entire museum worth of exploring like some tourist, simply for the sake of admiring the art and the architecture. If the previous locations had more Bekshinsky influences, with the decayed landscapes and pathetic creatures covered in dried up shells, this place goes full giger, with the grey tones and the sexual imagery. The insides of the palace are no less impressive. I am greeted by ornamentally crucified people with opened up cadavers, a Hindu deity looking statue with multiple arms in the center, and above all that, a massive network made out of living brains. On the surrounding walls, reliefs depicting insemination, pregnancy. There are some stranger things, like some odd tentacle creature being attached to a person's head, likely in order to connect with their brain, or someone resembling the parasites, such as the one attached to myself, holding on to people. These artworks suggest that while human bodies are valued as reproduction devices, this society might have been valuing mind over matter, trying to evolve beyond individual bodies into a higher connected sentience. 
This place also makes the impression that it might have been purposefully isolated from the rest. The factory is overgrown with cancer sprouts. Even before all the flesh and mutants, something was going wrong. A long and complicated trek using elevators and rail cars is required to get here. This likely still living hive brains was being kept safe from destruction, being something of great importance as well as probably one of the very few surviving things from before everything went down. It and whatever else resides in this palace. Continuing further I find two female shells laid down on tables, in a near ritualistic manner, their bellies pregnant and glowing red, suggesting they might still be living. In a different room I find jars of similar size and color to the pregnant bellies, containing some angry looking baby creatures. I take one and insert it into the stomach of a taken apart man. It immediately becomes restless. Settle down, babies. I'm completely unsure why I needed to insert the little dude into a big body just to still end up breaking the jar. I guess I wouldn't know that it's as aggressive as it is, but I end up picking up the little dude and crushing it to obtain its baby juice that I used to sprout a crimson flower from the third eye of one of the pregnant ladies. I guess I need more for the other lady. There are of course more baby jars and more bodies to insert them into. But this time, it results in a boss fight. This time, the angry baby gets functioning limbs and a grenade launcher. It asks no questions, it just goes for the kill. The first stage of the fight is not too terrible, having me shoot its glowy lungs or whatever they are when it's reloading. The second stage however gave me some trouble. The dude becomes even more aggressive, yet I had to provoke it into a melee attack so it would expose its belly with the baby jar. I enjoyed the combat in the rest of the game because its unwieldiness encouraged to avoid combat overall and successful fights would feel like actual victories. Being forced to fight here felt a little out of character, the clunkiness aside. When I finally defeat the bastard, I get to take its grenade launcher. But throughout the game my parasite kept growing its tendrils in and outside me, and now they grew so much they permanently attached the grenade launcher to my arm. That's not exactly great. And guess what? The second baby juice wasn't enough, so I had to fight yet another one of these dudes. Except now I'm already way low on the health and only have the grenade launcher. At least I managed to make short work of the third guy by tossing an explosive into its ammunition backpack. The parasite's tendrils grow all over my body at this point, covering my other hand as well, meaning I cannot interact with any objects. There seem to be machines meant specifically for freeing up hands from such growth, but that hurts and the tendrils regrow fast, so the following puzzles become rather high stakes. I have to act fast and I have limited attempts because they cause health. It can seem a bit frustrating. But it adds extra tension to this feeling of a culmination in this zone. It's already a very grand feeling, it looks like I'm finally getting somewhere and now I'm at my lowest point so far too. It looks like I don't have much more time left, so it's a make or break scenario nearly at the finish line. I saw some more puzzles that involve exploding things, which is always fun, and end up at a device meant specifically for removing such parasites as the one on my back. It doesn't go easy as the parasite already has a lot of control over my body. It doesn't go down without a fight and spill my guts all over the place. It manages to escape and I'm nearly dead, but I'm my own man at least for a little bit until I die. I want to note here that Scorn somehow managed to portray the feeling of intense pain and difficulty to move in a near death state perfectly accurately. There are plenty of similar scenes, such as this one in other games, but none feel quite as convincing. I'm not sure if it's the way the camera moves, how the protagonist walks, or how the sounds distort, but it seems exactly like what I had felt in real life. I'm not exactly someone of great health, and while of course I hadn't been in situations as dire, I feel like I had very similar sensations. 
There was this time where I had to walk several kilometers back home, but the pain in my leg from arthritis gradually kept increasing from an itch to some of the most intense pain I had felt in my life. Moving was increasingly difficult. The closer I got to my destination, the stronger the urge became to just collapse on the sidewalk, but I knew I had to press on, because no one would help me. The movement and pain felt quite familiar. The sound? I had faded once. I lost my senses, the control over my own body, but I was somehow still conscious. My brain was still aware. I could hear myself falling. The intense bang of my head hitting the floor, my heart pounding, the blood flowing in my head. It was loud, yet muffled. It had this distorted buzzing quality, and what's depicted in scorn is terrifyingly close to that real-life sensation I had. Anyway, I end up activating the second pregnant woman, or something, and attach myself to one of the crucifying devices. A tube starts sucking my semen, yep, that's my penis. The deity looking statue, which I guess now is more of a robot, comes up and starts disemboweling me, opens up my skull and connects my brain to the high mind. I know I'm about to die anyway, but it's horrifying how much the society disregards bodily matters. Such brutal operation, which I believe is fully automated, is performed on a fully conscious man without any painkillers. The world of scorn is truly the world of pain. I wake up as one of the pregnant women. I guess activating their third eyes, the crimson flowers, opened up the way straight to their minds, their consciousnesses and me now being connected to the brain network allowed me to penetrate my consciousness into their bodily shells. I guess the semen was also passed to ensure that it's my genetic code and consciousness that gets selected from the high mind. I can also switch between the two female bodies at will. My consciousness is no longer tied. I use the two women to unlock one last gate, which looks like a mural made out of living organs and muscles. It looks a bit like uterus and brain being connected, perhaps symbolizing rebirth, reincarnation, being born with the transferred consciousness. To open the gate I need to implant the key attachment to the women's arms, but they don't seem to be in pain or bleed, suggesting that they might have been fabricated as robots for remote control instead of being living people. I need to carry my own limb dying body through the gate while regularly stabbing it with a dagger. I guess to keep my body awake through the sensation of pain while the mind wanders through different bodies. It looks as if the gates of heaven itself opened up to me, but I can only go so far. Staying alive and moving is becoming increasingly harder until I lose connection with the high mind and the female bodies. I'm back in my own lifeless shell. I'm almost there, but I'm at my absolute lowest. I cannot even move anymore. The parasite uses this chance to come back and attach itself to me once again, penetrating my guts with a giant phallic organ and pinning me down rape style. It attaches itself to me permanently rooting down and growing into a disgusting meat tree at the gates of heaven. I'm so close, yet so far away. It's easy to get frustrated, but it would be too cheesy for this sort of game to have a nice ending, with everything going successfully. It only took me around 5 hours to get through the game while taking time to observe things, but the more I thought about it, the easier it became for me to accept such an ending. It really made me feel. It was heart gripping. I never expected that a horror game so grotesque could make me feel so emotional, in a good way. Yet after finishing the game, I just sat there, staring at the blank screen for several minutes, processing what happened. I can still feel the sensation while writing this. But whatever did any of that mean? I have some theories, and now that all the pieces are set, it is time to put them together. Having finished the game, I can pinpoint the central themes. The body horror in score is not just a genre or a way to shock the audience, but it's crucial to the plot. 
The lost civilization depicted in Scorn seems to disregard bodies and life altogether in favor of mind and higher sentience. Technology has reached such a stage where it became better to build everything out of living organic materials. All the machines are pretty much biocomputers. If you strip away the hard shell of walls or any other objects, you'd find living flesh inside. People are farmed not as people, but as mere resources. They might do some work or they might get salvaged and their bodies reused for other purposes. Even the more human creatures for whom all the machinery is designed for are disregarded since the machinery actively hurts the users. The last temple place had a giant network of brains and a lot of disemboweled bodies, which seemingly voluntarily went through the torture in order to ascend into becoming a high mind. It's almost as if this civilization was striving to escape the flesh prison of a body which is destined to die and suffer. People attempted extracting consciousness from a body so it could reincarnate elsewhere or even ascend to something completely different. The mind-controlled females that accepted the implants way better than the protagonist suggest that the entire factory might have been run using the high mind remote controlling drones that are well suited for the pain inducing machinery. The high mind could have even been the last remaining people capable of natural reproduction, desperately trying to control the remains of this place and the lower races. One can only fantasize where the rest of them went. Perhaps they all somehow died, or maybe they've gone through the gates seeking a better life. Of course, the very ending of the game seems the most confusing. What was behind the final gate? Why did the parasite do what he did? And why was their machinery built specifically for removing the parasite if we haven't seen any other creatures like that in the entire game? It didn't click with myself immediately either, but apparently the parasite is the very same person as the protagonist from the beginning of the game. For proof, we need to go back. After the explosion accident, the player's character goes unconscious and wakes up later, being reborn from a new pod in the wall. We had already established that there were two different protagonists all along, since the new one didn't have the hand implant and so the environment already changed after the accident. The first character, however, did not die from the explosion. During the explosion you can see him falling chest down, right side of the head to the ground. The guy depicted in the main menu is shown lying in the same exact pose. In the intro, he also breaks out of some brittle roots, which could as well be dried up solidified liquid that had covered him after the explosion. And if that's not good enough for you, he already had the arm implant in the intro. So the first act of the game is essentially his memory of how he got to that point. The parasite also had the first character's tool, which is now molded into its tail. That explains that the guy eventually came to, even after being covered in the liquid that was used for growing other creatures and likely had mutagenic properties. The last piece of evidence that the first guy is the parasite shows up at the end of the game when trying to remove him from your back. If you pay attention, you can make out a body in the same lying down pose grown into the back of the parasite. You can see the arms, the sideways head, even that tree bark looking mouth, which is different from the second character's smooth mouth. It looks like the part of the body that stayed above the liquid remained unchanged, but the rest morphed into something different. Now, the case of the parasite is still a tricky one, because it still seems strange that there are machines for removing it, even though it seems like an accidental mutant. But I don't believe it is one. If you remember, one of the murals in the temple depicts something similar to the parasites latching onto people, showing that these creatures might have been fairly common. My theory about them might be a bit far-fetched, since it stems from something I noticed in the art book, but it makes sense to me, so hopefully it isn't entirely baseless. In the end, the parasite's evolutionary goal seems to have been turning into a plant-like thing. 
The whole game it was sprouting something similar to Roots into the player's character, and during the ending scene, they merged completely, rooted to the ground and morphed into something resembling a plant or a tree. Yet it was still possible to make out some humanoid features like faces or arms. What I noticed in the art book was something similar in the assembly. In the concept art of the central pillar, the one that exploded, I could just about make out a face on an arm in a strikingly similar position to the parasites in the ending scene. It's hard to make out anything like that in the game itself, but the pillar branches its roots both into the ground and the ceiling, growing both upwards and downwards, not much unlike the tree of life. Such symbolism makes sense, since it seems to produce other living beings. But since it's still a being of flesh and blood, it needs to be inseminated, penetrated in its orifices by these phallic containers. I believe it's no coincidence that the liquid inside them is white. The cloning technology isn't quite the same as growing potatoes it seems. It actually requires a giant living organism that produces external wombs. It might be such genetic modifications that prevented natural conception as we know it. So my idea is that the tree of life, as one may call it, transferred its genetic code to the parasite and in the ending the parasite start growing into another one of these biological cloning machines. As worthless as this game may be, it seems that all the bits needed to piece its story together are out there. Of course it's not a very literal story, so the interpretation of its meaning is left up to the player. It's still difficult to tell what the goal of the protagonist or the parasite was. The protagonist might have been seeking salvation from death, ascension of consciousness from his dying body. I can come up with more different theories for the parasite though. It could have been just acting like a simple animal following primal instincts. It was simply attaching itself to the one host capable of feeding it and letting it grow. Instead of pinning the player down in the end like a rapist pins down a victim, it could have been more like a predator pinning down prey in the animal kingdom. Such simplicity would portray a very nihilistic idea that however much humanity would reach for something higher, heaven, nirvana, or some other type of ascension of mind, they are forsaken to be imprisoned by mortal flesh. Aside from carrying an ideologically grim thought, the parasite did not only stop the player, but also breached the quarantine, got into the palace and compromised the safety of the high mind and possibly all life. Since seeking immortality and transferring consciousness are important themes in Scorn, it could have been that the consciousness of the first protagonist transferred to the second one, and the parasite, the old body, is subconsciously desperately trying to reconnect with its mind. Alternatively, there's no telling how long the first character was around until he turned into the parasite and how much he knew. Maybe the mega brain high mind knew their world is dying and they were giving it some last kicks, activating and controlling the last people trying to reboot the human factory to restart their plans and that's what the second protagonist almost did but the first one turned into a parasite, broke free of mind control and stopped him? Or maybe the first protagonist was still reasonable as the parasite, and in this prior life he saw the horror of this world, the cruelty of the engineers that built this place, exploited the lower races, and did all he could to stop these horrors from happening ever again? The parasite still helping the second protagonist by holding items seems a bit contradictory then, but perhaps it needs the host to grow, and it keeps hurting the protagonist because it doesn't want him to go further. Something like that could be possible, because if we take a glance at the art book again, it shows some creatures of higher consciousness, creatures that people, after leaving their own bodies, turn into. And those creatures seem to take some blue and purple tones, as if their internal organs are outside. That's not much unlike how the parasite looks. It's a lot more vibrant colored creature, with its organs exposed in contrast with the grey world, where everything is covered by hard shells. 
It also has brains exposed in a similar fashion. Perhaps it is not even an ending of cruelty and nihilism, but one of hope, with the tree of life sprouting right next to the gate, so Eden would only be reachable to an innocent new generation. The vertical shape of the final gate also suggests that, instead of heaven, it could be gate of rebirth, reincarnation. But I'm personally not a huge fan of this theory, but I think it's no lesser of an interpretation than the other ones. Talking about this game, I have purposefully avoided some things from the artbook, the same way I avoided indulging in other people's theories much, so my own interpretation could be untainted. The artbook depicts some things that never made it to the final game. Some people may argue that the cut content would have made the game a lot better. There were some more explanations about jar babies, who were never really babies but rather clever engineers with weak bodies. The artbook also talked about the race or class wars. I for one believe that the cut content didn't make it to the final game for a reason. Because it's more of a metaphorical story of pilgrimage, cruelty, the contact of nature and technology, reproduction and transcendence. There being faction wars and such would have grounded the story too much and distracted from the main topics, which now were rather fleshed out and consistently prominent throughout the entire game, symbiotic with all the visuals and mechanics. Anything unnecessary, any padding or distractions are unwelcome here. It's easy to get frustrated at Scorn. The game turned out to be pretty short, especially after roughly 6 long years of waiting since the original announcement. It can also be difficult to turn off the conditioned gamer brain that counts the game's value by dollars per hour. I understand the wishes for this game to last longer, for some of the mechanics, such as the body swapping at the end, and being explored more, but at the same time, I cannot comprehend how Scorn was originally planned to consist of two games. As it is now, I would say it's incredibly well paced. No feature of the game overstays its welcome or repeats until becoming a simple chore. The game only shows what it absolutely needs to show for maximum impact. It's as refined of an idea as it can be. While openly taking inspiration from Zislav Bekshinsky or Hans Rudi Giger, it's a strong and beautiful creation of its own. It does exactly what it had set out to do from the very beginning. Scorn evokes feelings that words would not be able to. Its perfect synthesis of visual art, sound design, gameplay and storytelling is something that I will remember forever, despite the game's runtime. To quote the artbook, Part of the fascination comes down to there being few absolutes in horror. One person's fear may be deemed ridiculous by others. Likewise, it would make little sense to have one definitive story and one definitive meaning. Instead, it's like a great piece of any other form of art. It aims to evoke as strong feelings as possible within the players, making for a strong base to weave thoughts and interpretations around. Instead of being an equivalent of junk food, pleasantly and easily digestible, Scorn is something that can be talked about for days to come. It was quite a trip for me, and it was definitely worth the wait. I'm happy you joined me for it. I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and see you in the next one.